I have entitled this study, The Condition of the Human Race. And I know that's a very broad subject, and it's going to need to be broken down and clarified. For example, I'm not addressing the physical condition of the human race, over the, even though that might enter into the discussion. I'm not addressing the social condition of the human race, nor am I addressing the economic condition of the human race. I'm not addressing the ecological condition of the human race, and I'm not going to be dealing with global warming or the effect of the ozone because of greenhouse and industrial gases. I'm not addressing the political condition of the human race, particularly as we approach another election here in the United States. And I'm not addressing the religious condition of the human race, for that is a real mess. My objective is primarily con to consider the spiritual condition of the human race. And so the purpose of this study is to consider the condition of human beings in or as a result of the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, the event that's recorded in Genesis chapter 3 that we typically refer to as the fall of man into sin. And I'm going to assume that you, the listeners, are quite cognizant of the narrative there in Genesis 3, and that we don't need to look at those events in detail or consider the particular theological meaning of what happened in those events. Instead of looking at the specifics of the events in Genesis 3, I intend to consider the general extended consequences of the fall of man into sin and how those consequences were extended to the human race as a whole. If indeed they were, because I've just tipped my hand in intimating that I believe that there are consequences to what Adam and Eve did, then those consequences extend to all, so all humanity. So my intent in the study is to make a challenge. A challenge of the doctrine of original sin, which has been thoroughly entrenched in Christian theology, in Roman Catholic theology since the 4th and 5th century, and in Protestant theology since the 16th century. And at the same time, I want to challenge the theses of original goodness, along with original innocence and original neutrality, which may be the same thing, but I've listed them separately. And the question might be asked, what's left? Because that pretty well covers the range of thought concerning the spiritual character condition of humanity in consequence of Adam and Eve's sin. I'm going to begin by addressing what I call the vile man thesis. And this is what has historically been identified as original sin. Now, we're, we're not talking merely about the first original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, but we're talking about the theological doctrine of original sin by which Augustine, in the 4th and 5th centuries, explained the consequences of Adam and Eve's disobedience for and upon the whole human race. And so the vile man thesis of original sin is the thesis of the anthropological ontology of inherent evil. Anthropological, that has to do with man. The Greek word for man is anthropos. Ontology comes from the Greek word ontos, usia, which means being. The being, the spiritual being of man. The character of evil, contrary to the character of God, has allegedly been infused, injected, imputed, and imparted into the very being of human being, causing sin and evil to be essentially 
inherently and intrinsically part of human being or humanness. And it is alleged that this is transmitted generationally, if not genetically, by physical seminal transmission through physical paternity. And once again, it is the males who are the culprits or the fall guys in this particular perspective. This particular thesis indicates that every human from Adam onward is born an inherently sinful being. That in our nascent, natival condition, we are by nature children of wrath, but we are inherently, innately, and intrinsically sinful human beings. This has been traditionally known as the depravity of mankind. Now, what does depravity mean? Etymologically, it comes from the Latin pravus or pravitas, meaning crooked or perverse. Linguistically, it came to mean corruption, debased, deviant, degenerate, debauchery, dissipation, degradation, decadence. And Christian theology has defined this condition as the innate corruption of human nature due to original sin, which simply means that all human beings are essentially and intrinsically evil that ha human beings have a sinful human nature. We are bad to the bone, one might say. That human beings are corrupted with concupiscence. That's a word that Protestants don't use all that often, but it's certainly used within the Roman Catholic Church. And it involves a selfish orientation to the sinful fulfillment of one's appetites and desires, and it often carries a sensual or sexual connotation, and generally is taken to be synonymous with corrupt, sinful human nature. So continuing then with the discussion of the depravity of mankind, this particular thesis or theory indicates that human beings are totally defective and deficient, unable to function as the humans that God created them to be. In other words, that we are essentially subhuman from the point of the fall onward. Human beings are unable to think, feel, or make decisions as God designed human beings to do. We're subhuman. And human beings are unable to respond to whatever God might do on their behalf. So this, this is a thesis of the total inability of man. That man is incapable of functioning as the faith creature that God created man to be. You see, we were created to be receivers. Receptive, dependent, derivative creatures. And the thesis of depravity is actually a denial of our basic humanness. It denies our humanness on three levels. It denies that we have real and legitimate freedom of choice. It denies that we are derivative creatures. And it denies that we function on three levels, spiritual, psychological, and physiological function. And it basically affirms that humans cannot respond to the grace of God in faith. So continuing this study of total depravity, and by the way, total does not refer to the totality of mankind affected by the sin of Adam and Eve, but it refers to the totality of an individual's human ability and function affected and debilitated by the fall. So the thesis of total depravity 
indicates that it affects the totality of human ability and function, and therefore indicates that human beings are debased, deviant, despicable, devilish, diseased with sin, disgusting, and damned. Oh, we could add a few more D words. Degraded, debaucherous, decadent, almost to the point of being human devils who can only produce evil and sin. And it is often indicated in the teaching of total depravity that this human condition is irreversible. That's right. Irreversible. Can't be changed. Now, there are variations within the Augustinian Calvinist camp about whether depravity is irreversible, but the purists, the hardliners, often indicate that the depraved human condition is irreversible. It's as if they are saying, once depraved, always depraved. If depravity has inf infected the essential nature of our humanity, our humanness, there is no spiritual fix or restoration that can remedy our human degradation. So let's look at what we've called the Augustinian Calvinist perspective of the human condition, and we're talking about the spiritual condition of man. It began with Augustine of Hippo back in uh, the 4th and 5th centuries, and of course was continued by John Calvin. And the thesis is that even though an individual should be one of God's arbitrarily chosen elect, they will always retain a wicked heart, and they will remain merely sinners saved by grace. In other words, that, that condition is irreversible. Well, that's one, that's one perspective on, on the spiritual condition of the human race. But let's switch to another and take a look at that perspective. And now we're going to look at the, the idea of human potential as the thesis of the human condition. This is the antithesis of the vile man thesis of original sin and total depravity. Now, there are variations of perspective on the condition of the human race, even within this category of human potential. There are some who indicate that uh, there is a sense of original goodness of character within all men, that mankind is essentially and inherently good. We, we, instead of the vile man thesis, we could call this the good man premise, or the innocent man premise. And in, and in this particular perspective, the condition of each individual can go either way, to good or to evil, based on a person's free will. And, and this particular human potential idea often involves original innocence and original neutrality, that we're not oriented toward good or evil in any sense, but that every man has the unlimited freedom and potential to be all that he can be. I guess that means that any person could actually be Jesus, could be perfect, if he just put his mind to it and was resolutely committed to such. So what we're looking at under this idea is that of the humanistic premise, which indicates that Human nature is a blank slate, a tabula rasa. And the sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden had no ongoing effect on humanity as a whole. No continuing, extended, comprehensive effect on human beings. They oftentimes will use Deuteronomy 24.16, saying that the guilt and condemnation cannot be transferred across the generations. 
This seems in Deuteronomy to apply to capital punishment rather than the extension of consequences of Adamic sin. Part of the thesis of the humanistic premise is what they call the free will of man. And this often ends up being a deification of human reason and volition. They even use terms like the sovereign will of man. And their thesis is that human beings can self-determine what they want to be and how they want to function. That human beings can self-generate their own self-chosen character, either good or evil, sinfulness or righteousness. Now I recall that the serpent, Satan, in the Garden of Eden, suggested that man could be like God. And it is true, I believe, that God does have absolute free will. He self-determines what he's going to do, always in the context of who he is, his own character, because he does what he does, because he is who he is. And the omnipotent, almighty God, he alone has the inherent divine power to implement and self-generate that which he has self-determined to an act by his own grace, the implementation of his character. And that, I believe, is, is a true understanding of free will, self-determination, self-generation. But humanity does not have the inherent character to self-determine like God does, nor do we have the inherent power to self-generate and implement such character in action. So I don't believe man has free will in the sense that God has free will. I do believe that a degree of self-determination is a part of our humanness. We're going to call that freedom of choice. I do believe that we are in one sense self-determinative creatures because God made us choosing creatures. And what we're now discussing is often referred to as the humanistic or Pelagian perspective of the human condition. And I must say that sometimes this, this premise is quite popularly accepted in Christian circles. That uh, all human beings, and we'll go back here to Pelagius, he's the one that is often thought to have brought this idea into prominence uh, in, in his debates against Augustine. And the premise is that all human beings have inherent immortality, and will live forever one place or the other, in heaven or in hell. I have a problem with that. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, God alone possesses immortality. And 2 Timothy 1.10, it says, Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. But they go on to say that by the inherent freedom and potential of self-determination, every human being will choose his own destiny. Let me just make a few more comments while we're here about Pelagius. He lived from 354 to 418 AD. He was a British monk and moralist who later moved to Rome and challenged Augustine. He opposed Augustine's doctrine of predestination. He argued for the free will of man. And vehement contention and conflict is indicated in their writings between Augustine and Pelagius, and their contrary opinions have existed down through Christian thought. So what we've done so far is to consider two contrasting perspectives of the human condition after and in consequence of Adam's sin. Philosophically, we might indicate that these are determinism versus humanism, or theologically, they are Augustinianism versus Pelagianism. What's your preference?
Do you have one? Or we might say, is there another alternative? Or perhaps a modified version of one of these positions or the other? And if so, how would you explain that alternative perspective? Well, I want to move on to how I would explain that alternative perspective. And I call it the derivative man thesis. You see, divine determinism and humanism, Augustinianism and Pelagianism, Pelagianism both base their systems on anthropological ontology. The being of man is in his humanness. But I am ad advocating that the ultimate being of man is not in his humanness, but has to do with a pneumatological spiritual ontology. That the ontology, the being of mankind, can be based on spiritual condition rather than on a natural and physical condition of humanity. That the spiritual being and condition of mankind is derived from spirit being of either God or Satan. That humans are not essentially or inherently good or sinful. Their spiritual condition and character is derived from a spirit source. And so we go back to Adam and Eve's fall into sin. And I do believe that there's an extended affect and effect among humanity based upon Adam and Eve's disobedient sin. I believe that Adam and Eve's fall into sin affected the human race spiritually, but did not infuse, impute, or impart essential or inherent character into the humanness of all humanity. That human beings are not essentially inherently evil and sinful, but neither are they essentially and inherently good or innocent. Because I do believe that Adam and Eve's fall into sin affected what we can call an original spirit identification and spirit union for all descendants of the original couple. This is not original sin. This is not original goodness but an original spirit identification that all men are born with, or perhaps we should say born into. Paul explains this in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 5 says that all men in Adam were made sinners. Romans 5.19, through the one man's disobedience, and the one man is Adam, the many, that is all men, were made sinners. And made sinners seems to me to refer to spiritual identity in like manner as made righteous refers to spiritual identity as the verse continues. That it's not an essential or intrinsic attribution of humanness. We are not inherently, intrinsically, essentially sinful, but neither are we made inherently, intrinsically, and essentially righteous. And this requires that we abandon the platonic and dualistic premise perpetuated and made popular in Christian thought by Augustine, that man is a dichotomy of body and soul, because what I'm suggesting requires that we accept a tri-level understanding of man's function that differentiates between soul and spirit function. I'm proposing that made sinners is a spiritual problem in man, not a problem with man's humanness. Romans 5.19 continues that through the obedience of the one, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. And this does not mean that Christians are made righteous, essentially and inherently. Only God is righteous in the sense of his character being an essential character. 
We are not made righteous in the same sense that God is righteous. We are made righteous as a designation of our spiritual identification, our spiritual identity in conjunction with Jesus Christ, the righteous one, with whom we have been joined in spiritual union, 1 Corinthians 6.17. And our spiritual identity is that of righteous ones, even holy ones, by the derived righteousness of Jesus' character, by the derived holiness of his character as he lived is, lives in us. It's not essential or intrinsic to our being human. So instead of an inherent or intrinsic nature of man, I'm saying that human beings are not cursed with an inherent sinful human nature, nor are they blessed with an essential nature of goodness or human potential. I'm saying that the spiritual nature of man is identified by the nature of the spiritual personage who dwells within his spirit. And this is a derived spiritual nature. Now, now I must point out that nature is a very ambiguous word in the English language, and uh, its meanings are all over the map. We hear people speak of Mother Nature, we find nature being used of the natural cosmos, cosmos and universe. Nature versus nurture in the field of psychologist, psychology. And Einstein even indicated that nature was his God. I would like to limit my use of the word nature to use it in reference to the spiritual condition of humanity. And I think that's how the New Covenant literature uses nature, and the Greek word phusis. The New Testament does not speak of a person having two natures simultaneously, as some Christians have taught. The New Testament does not refer to an old sinful nature, that would be the Greek phrase polios phusis, nor does it ever refer to a new nature, that would be the Greek phrase kainos phusis. It does, however, seem to indicate that in our unregenerate spiritual condition, we were by nature, phusus, children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 3. And in our regenerate spiritual condition, we are partakers of the divine phusus, nature. 2 Peter 1, 4. So what I'm advocating is that we have a derived spiritual nature, and we're going on to consider that unregenerate individuals are made sinners by spiritual identification with the Spirit, who is the source of all sin, and are identified with his nature and character. And the verses that I use for that expression are Ephesians 2.2, 2, the Spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, and Ephesians 2, 3, we are by nature children of wrath. Regenerate individuals, on the other hand, are made righteous by spiritual identification with the Spirit of Christ and are identified with His nature and character. We are partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. We are Christ ones. We are Christians. We are saints. We are children of God, sons of God, holy, righteous, perfect, and there are many other terms and designations by which we can refer to spiritual Christian identity, our derived spiritual identity, our derived spiritual nature. But we must, almost, we must also consider the spiritual death of all mankind in Adam. And it seems quite apparent in Scripture that uh, there's a death consequence of sin. And that, that was made known all the way back into the initial account of, uh, as God declared to Adam and Eve in Genesis 2.17. He said, you are, you're not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die or it could be translated, dying, you shall die. 
Now what did God mean by that? You shall not eat of it, you will surely die. I don't think that was a threat of an offended, angry God who would impose a death penalty on the human violators. He's, I don't conceive God as a death dealer. He's the God. He's a living God. The God of life. I think that what God said to Adam and Eve back there in the garden was simply a statement of the consequence of the inevitable alternative of deriving from God's life. If you don't derive from God's life, the only alternative is death. It's life or death. Romans 6.23 does say the wages of sin is death. The choice that Adam and Eve had at the tree of life back in Genesis 2.9 was the choice of experientially deriving from the divine life of God in their human behavior. That's the very life that had been breathed into man in Genesis 2.7. And, and out of that derived spiritual condition, it was the choice of man to allow for the divine outworking of the divinely inbreathed life of God. Derived life in condition and derived life in behavioral expression. And so the spiritual death that came upon Adam and Eve is, was such that the death spread to all men. When, when God said, dying you shall die, in Genesis 2.17, I think that relates to the progressive forms of spiritual death, behavioral death, dead works, physical death, and eventual everlasting death. And so we look at the scriptures and we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die. The consequences of death that occurred in Adam affect everyone. Romans 5, 12 says, through one man's sin, that's Adam. No, through one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned in Adam. Romans 5.17, by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned. Romans 5.21, sin reigned in death. Now what we're seeing here is that there is a personified ontology of death, whereby it says death reigned. It means it's, it's personified. There's a, there's a sense of being to it. And, it, and this, this death is, of course, identified with the evil one. Satan is not only the ontological being of sin, he's the ontological being of death. And so we point out this personified ontology of death's reign and proceed to the ontological being of death. Hebrews 2.14 says, The one having the power of death, that is the devil. And that's obviously a personified being. Spiritual death in mankind is not to be defined as merely privation or absence of life, nor as a divine imposition of punishment. Spiritual death is the derived spiritual condition of the presence and character function of Satan in mankind. Satan's character can be manifested in man and in man's behavior. So now we re return back to the basic function of humanness in what we're calling the freedom of choice. And we've said that only God has the free will to self-determine and self-generate his own actions consistent with his own divine being. But you see, God self-limited himself to allow man to have the freedom of choice to receive God's grace for a personal relationship with God and the derivation of spiritual condition and character. Previously in our discussion of Pelagianism and humanism, 
we referred to the premise of the inherent immortality of mankind. But in what I'm calling the de derivative man thesis, I explain the derived destiny of mankind as derived immortality or destruction. See, there is a human freedom of choice. The receptivity of God's activity allows for derived spiritual identity that extends to a derived spiritual destiny. And based on our spiritual condition, there is a continuity and perpetuity of the derived spiritual life that we have in Christ, or the continuity and perpetuity of derived spiritual death in identification with Satan, whereby we proceed into everlasting death and destruction prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25. So what I'm saying is, that there's a spiritual identification with Christ that leads to heaven, and there's a spiritual identification with Satan that leads to hell. And I am one who unashamedly believes in the either-or destiny and destinations of heaven and hell. So the derivative man thesis that I am proposing as a viable explanation of the condition of humanity. This thesis agrees with the Augustinian Calvinist premise that Adam's fall affected the entire human race, but disagrees that it affected essential sinfulness in man. And this derivative man thesis agrees with the Pelagian humanist premise that human beings have freedom of choice, but disagrees that human beings can generate their own character. So what I'm saying is that the derivative man thesis is my proposal for a different perspective of the effect of Adam and Eve's action on the condition, spiritual condition of the human race. And it seems to be a moderating position between the extremes of determinism and humanism and seems, at least to me, to accord with the biblical record. And that's how I see the human condition, or the condition of the human race.